Good afternoon, everybody. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, be here with you today. And I uh, want to share with you uh, a couple thoughts I had as I was putting this presentation together. The uh, association I represent, the IGGA, is actually celebrating its 50th anniversary this year. Uh, it was established in uh, 1972. And I found it interesting that the uh, 50th uh, anniversary of the organization allowed me to be here in the great state of Georgia where the foundation was cast for everything that we, we stand for as an association. And uh, interesting little story that I thought I would share with you. Back in 1973 or uh, 74, the uh, commissioner at the time, and I'm trying to remember his name, um, but the, the DOT commissioner wrote a letter to the concrete pavement industry and said, uh, hey, we're going to stop paving concrete in the state until you come up with a program that allows us to repair, maintain, and preserve our concrete pavements. And of course, that caught the attention of the, the industry straight away. Uh, so the, the industry did bear down and put together a program where they're looking at uh, fast and efficient full depth repair, partial depth repair, diamond grinding, and so on. And they packaged that up in uh, such a way that uh, it was usable, understandable, and uh, doable by, by anybody that was involved in the pavement business. So uh, that precipitated a seminar which took place in uh, 1976 in Augusta, Georgia, where uh, dozens of engineers from all over the country came and observed a uh, hands-on demonstration of what could be done in terms of repairing, maintaining, and uh, preserving concrete pavement. It included uh, uh, joint reseal, uh, patching, uh, full depth repair, that type of stuff, diamond grinding, the whole bit. And uh, it was uh, received uh, with open arms by the uh, Georgia DOT. A short six years later, and let's see, I cannot make out the name. Tom, was it Morello? Was it? Moreland, thank you very much. There's an interchange in Atlanta with his name on it. Got it. Okay, that explains how you knew it like that, huh? Thank you. So he wrote a letter back to the industry six years later, and uh, I, I broke out just a little bit of the, the letter, um, and I'll read the most important part. We have restored our confidence in concrete paving, and we're now letting many projects allowing it as an alternate. And I think uh, that's really key from my perspective. It, if you don't have confidence in the pavements that you're going to build or that you, that you, if you think you can't repair them or preserve them or make them get maximum life, what are the chances of you using that pavement type? Well, we're very limited. Uh, hence, uh, you know, our mission in life is to uh, make sure that you have the best tools going and understand how to use them and provide support wherever and whenever we can. So that effort didn't stop with GDOT at that point in time. There are other people that carried the flag. Two uh, notable mentions were uh, Wooter Goulden and uh, Alan Childers, who uh, carried the flag uh, for repair, maintenance, and preservation right up to the day that they uh, retired. And uh, how many here from uh, Georgia DOT right now? Show of hands. Uh, do these names? Uh, yeah, we got a couple people here that recognize them. Yeah, great people, great men, and uh, did a real fine job. And you know, I can't overstate the impact that the state of Georgia, Georgia DOT, had on the concrete pavement industry. And you know, certainly, uh, the department rode high on the on this reputation for years and years and years. Unlike the failed effort of GDOT trying to build the next generation of uh, inexpensive, high-speed snow removal vehicles, which ultimately failed in short order, and uh, they they shelved it. Uh, before it got out. But anyway, uh, back to business here. Uh, you know, in the past, when you talked about concrete pavement, many people thought, oh, that's the noisy pavement, that's the rough pavement. But in recent years, we've seen a, uh, an acceptance of diamond saw cut surface textures that have really eliminated a lot of those stigma. And there's three different ones that are primary in the, the pavement world uh, that I'll touch on today. In the program, my intent is to talk to you about the next generation concrete surface, but there are a lot of similarities which cause uh, a bit of confusion with regards to these surface types, so I, I figured I'd break them each out and then show you how they all work together. There's conventional diamond grinding, which you're probably most familiar with, safety grooving, and then the next generation concrete surface. Whatever diamond saw, uh, saw cut surface 
that we're talking about, we're going to have some things in common. And that's going to be the diamond tip saw blades, which you see in the, uh, the upper left-hand corner. There's the diamond tip saw blade there. And then in the foreground, we have what we call a spacer. And these blades and spacers are stacked on an arbor, which you see over here on the right, alternating uh, blade, spacer, blade, all the way across the shaft. The um, head is then taken and bolted underneath a machine such as this. This is a PC 6000 EC diamond grinding machine. And the, uh, the basic premise of the, the machine is the removal of a thin surface layer of concrete uh, using these closely spaced diamond saw blades. You'll end up with a smooth, level pavement surface. It's going to provide you with a longitudinal texture with desirable friction and, and low noise characteristics, and oftentimes we perform it in conjunction with all the other concrete pavement preservation techniques like fold-up repair, partial, and so on. And this will give you an idea of what the, the texture is really supposed to look like. You can see in the picture up on top, it's a, uh, a relatively smooth looking surface. So it looks like corduroy fabric actually. And uh, looking at the, the cutaway at the bottom, the uh, grooves are created by the tips of the saw blades. The saw blades uh, almost always are going to be 125 thousandths in width, about an eighth inch. So there's a consistent width to your grooves. In between, we have the land areas. The land areas are uh, created where there is no blade contact, and we expect the concrete to break off at a relatively uh, level surface. The, uh, the land area is going to vary depending upon the amount of removal and the type of aggregate that you are grinding. The harder the aggregate, the tighter you're going to want to space the blades together, uh, that way allowing for the, uh, the, the concrete to break off at a relatively level surface. The uh, picture that you see on the right here is a situation where the, the blade spacing is just a little bit too wide. It's not super critical, but it's not great either. Chances are these fins would break off under traffic. But um, the ideal solution would be to put in a thinner spacer because clearly the aggregate was too hard for the spacing that was chosen. So it's easy for me to stand up here and uh, you know give you uh, uh, accolades in terms of you know what the, the 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 product can do and what it can't do, but I think it's uh, far more convincing and um, sometimes easier to use the the uh, results obtained by other departments of transportation, which I've done here. I actually clipped a few slides from a presentation recently given at, given at my annual meeting by a, a engineer from Arizona DOT, and uh, this involves the the single largest buried treasure project on the planet. And when I say buried treasure, this is essentially a concrete pavement that was overlaid for functional reasons, not structural, but functional, like uh, ride. In this particular case, it was noise. And um, it was overlaid with a, a thin lift uh, asphalt rubber surface, uh, which is now coming to terms. And this talks about uh, some of the research conducted uh, behind their decisions. In 2003, they had a terrible noise problem. The entire valley, Phoenix Valley, was uh, up in arms because they had their concrete pavements surfaced using a uh, transverse tining, which is the, the loudest surface you can put on a, a concrete pavement. So a political decision was uh, made at that point in time by the uh, Maricopa Association of Governors. And um, they basically said, OK, here's a pot of money. Go overlay all the concrete in the valley. Let's get rid of this noise problem. The DOT did not agree with that solution because it wasn't a long-term solution in terms of money. All right? And this is why uh, having dedicated funds, number one, is a very, very good thing. And number two, uh, let the DOT make the decisions in terms of you know, when and where and how. The uh, ADOT was planning on switching to a, a longitudinal type texture at that point in time, but it was a little too little, a little too late. Uh, the politicians took over, and they just overlaid the system. The problem is, is that they did it all at one time. They had enough money to do it. Then, all of a sudden, everything's coming to terms. They, they have 5,500 lane miles they're concerned with, and uh, the rubberized asphalt was designed to last about 10 years, but over 50% of the, the material that's still on, on the ground in service is over 10 years old. So it's not that the asphalt rubber was a bad product or wasn't doing its job. It's at the end of its life. Now they don't have any money to deal with it. And this is a problem for the DOT because it's starting to delaminate and make for a rough ride in dangerous conditions. So 
they began to think, well, what about the concrete underneath? That was in pretty good shape. That was just a, a functional issue. It wasn't structural. You know, what if we went back to the concrete surface? And uh, could we make it better? Could we make it quieter? So they started investigating diamond saw cut surface textures. And would it, could it you know, last a lot longer if, it, if we needed a little less maintenance or replacement? Well, they went out and did a pilot project and they found you know, initially, hey, good ride, quiet, pretty good looking. Let's uh, pursue this further. So they undertook uh, a research project looking at a number of different sections of diamond ground concrete versus the uh, asphalt rubber. And basically, the, uh, the diamond grinding held up and uh, you know, met the match. Uh, basically, it had similar IRI. Actually, the, the diamond grinding had a slightly better IRI and a slightly better friction number. Had twice the service life, three times the service life, up to 30 years in this particular case, with a slightly lower initial cost and a, a better life cycle cost. Initially, the, uh, the diamond ground surface was a little bit louder than the, uh, the new asphalt rubber, but the, the rubber gains about a half a decibel noise per year. So uh, it was three to four decibels louder than the diamond grinding after nine to 12 years. So it looked like, hey, we have a solution here. The, the one thing that uh, I'll give to them certainly was the fact that you know a brand new asphalt uh, rubber overlay is very, very pretty. It looks good on the road and uh, looked a little bit better than the the diamond ground section. So they went after it. Hey, we have very good concrete underneath. It was overlaid because of noise, not because of structure. Uh, both the, the rubber and the grinding offer good noise reduction. Both are smooth and, smooth and safe. Both look good enough. And uh, it saved them money over 30 years. So that's uh, a direction that they've been going. And uh, an excellent use of uh, conventional diamond grinding in a situation that uh, bears innovative solutions. The next treatment I want to talk to you about is safety grooving. And it's a procedure that utilizes the, the same diamond tip saw blades, uh, the same types of machines. And basically what we're going to do is uh, have these blades mounted on a shaft and they're going to cut channels into the pavement that allow the water to drain between the tire and the pavement interface. Uh, the roadway pavement's grooved the same way. Uh, the, it's diamond ground, except that the diamond blades are spaced further apart. Now it's been around a long, long time. Safety grooving is actually mentioned in historical records and uh, apparently goes all the way back to uh, the Greek and, and Roman times. So it's, it's nothing new. The concept, uh, of course, it wasn't for rubber tire back then. It was for horses slipping on, the, on their pavement. But again, it's been around a long time. And as a matter of fact, it holds a very special place in the NASA Innovation Hall of Fame, where uh, back in the early 70s, the treatment won acclaim from NASA. So there you have a good idea what the head looks like. Right? You can see that these blades, the same blades basically, are spaced three quarters of an inch apart. So what that means is we're going to be able to put macro texture into that pavement, but we're not going to be able to make it any smoother. We're not going to be taking any bumps out. Uh, we're not going to be making it any quieter as we would with the conventional diamond grinding, but we are adding tons of macro texture. You can orient the blades either in a longitudinal or a transverse direction. Uh, it reduces splash and spray, reduces hydroplaning potential and wet weather accidents by up to 70%, which I'll touch on in just a couple slides. It enhances tire pavement uh, interlock and lateral stability, so you think about that when you're driving at a rate of speed through a super or a, a ramp and it's wet and so on, uh, that mechanical interlock between the tire and the pavement actually reduces accidents. And uh, again, you can use it on both concrete and asphalt pavement. And this will be a comparison here between the conventional diamond grinding on top, and you remember, 125 thousandths in the channels here created by the blades, 1 8 inch and the land area, which is going to be somewhere between 80 thousandths and 110 thousandths, depending upon the hardness of the aggregate. And then we have the diamond groove section. Again, same blades, 125 thousandths, uh, eighth inch. But now we're going to space them three quarters of an inch apart, which is standard here in the United States, giving us macro texture, but no improvement in smoothness or noise reduction. Uh, in terms of uh, the safety that I was discussing, Caltrans undertook a, a very, very robust study. It was a four, over a four-year period, and they were comparing the benefits of, of safety grooving, longitudinal grooving. And all grooved and ungrooved control sections were located on freeways in the urban Los Angeles area. They had uh, 322 lane miles of grooved pavement. So this wasn't a 1,000-foot test section. This was the real deal. 
and they had uh, 750 lane miles of ungrooved control sections. And I, I broke out what I see as the most important part of the, the, the documentation here. It was a 20% reduction in total accidents, a 50% reduction in fatal accidents, and a 70% reduction in wet pavement accidents as compared to the ungrooved sections. So my challenge to you is if you have a ramp or a, uh, a super or an area where you have run off the road accidents, especially in wet weather conditions, find your worst one, pick it out, and let's, we'll figure out a way to get a groover down there somehow, some contractor moving through your neck of the woods, and uh, we'll groove that thing for you. And let's, I challenge you, if you don't see a major shift in the amount of accidents on that particular section, I'll, I don't know what else to say. I don't want to trade my job, but you get the idea. Bring your worst and we'll, uh, we'll give it a crack. Basically what's happening here is we're not removing the water from the surface as much as we're just providing an escape route. The faster you go, the harder it is for the water to, to squeeze out from between the tire and the pavement. And that's why you know, you're more likely to hydroplane at 60 than you are at six miles an hour. The, uh, the texture acts like tire tread and it allows a place for the water to escape. Uh, you have increased macro texture, reduced splash and spray, and thereby reduces potential of hydroplaning. And if you look at the picture here, you can see the groove section in the foreground and the ungrooved. Uh, it just it positively looks dry. Some of you may remember uh, my coworker Larry Schofield uh, spent the better part of three or four years driving coast to coast with a, uh, a locked wheel friction tester that we had uh, purchased from Missouri DOT several years ago and we were intent on learning more about the uh, diamond saw cut surface textures that I'm talking about here today. We wanted better, better data. And it was hard to get data from the DOTs uh, because of uh, attorneys, right? They, they don't want to release a whole bunch of information that could be used against them years later. So we felt like, okay, we'll take uh, matters into our own hands. Went out and bought the machine, fixed it up, and uh, sent Larry on his merry way for, like I say, several years. In order to get an adequate idea of what kind of uh, texture you have in terms of safety, friction, so on and so forth, the best way to go about it is to use two different types of tires, the E501 or the E524 uh, ASTM designations. And basically one is, has ribs on it and the other one is a ball tire. The uh, rib tire simulates dry weather conditions and the, uh, the smooth tire, the ball tire, simulates wet weather conditions. Oddly enough, most DOTs that still do uh, skid testing seem to lean on the rib tire more than on both, which is really the better way to go. Now here's some, uh, uh, some data that was collected that gives you an idea of the benefit of grooving. On the, the right-hand side of the picture that you're looking at here, okay, we have before longitudinal grooving. So we had a chunk of pavement, Larry went out before it was grooved, and he did a rib tire test, a series of them, I'm certain, and a, uh, a smooth, actually this is, uh, yeah, on I-70 and KDOT as a matter of fact. So there were rib tire tests conducted pre-grooving and then smooth tire tests conducted pre-grooving. And you can see here the, uh, on the, the y-axis, the higher up you go, the, the higher the number, the more friction that was measured. So you can see here pre-grooving that the smooth tire, which again better simulates wet weather conditions, you can see that it's you know, half of what we found with the dry weather conditions, the rib tire. If we move over to the left side of the, the graphic where measurements were taken after the longitudinal grooving was conducted, you can see the marked increase in the amount of, of uh, skid resistance as measured with that ball tire, again, which is wet weather conditions. So you can see why you can have a massive reduction in accidents, wet weather accidents in particular, when you use a longitudinal grooving on your, on your pavements. It's remarkable. So we talked about conventional diamond grinding and we talked about safety grooving. Now we're going to talk about the next generation concrete surface, which happens to be a mix between the two. The next gen is a diamond saw cut surface texture that's absent of positive or upward texture, resulting in a uniform land profile design with a predominantly negative texture. 
And this is why the, the, this profile is responsible for the lower overall noise level of the, the surface. On the left down here at the bottom, you have a conventional diamond grinding head. Uh, obviously here we have a, a standard diamond grinding machine up on top. And over here on the right is a single pass next generation concrete surface diamond uh, blade assembly. The, the use of a, a single pass unit like this is not common, but I use it here in today's presentation because it gives you an idea of how the surface is created. If you look between the blades that are standing proud, you're gonna see a very tight blade stack, which means that the spacers used are very, very thin. These blades are almost touching each other. So essentially what we're doing is we're taking the entire top of the concrete pavement off. We're gonna expose all the aggregate. Then we have grooving blades. And these blades, which are again shown here in a single pass, uh, are, are typically done in a second pass that goes over the previously ground pavement, uh, thereby giving you the macro texture that we desire. So this cross section sort of tells it all here. Once again, the, the, uh, the entire surface is ground using a standard diamond grinding blade stacked very, very tight with 35,000 spacers typically. We trim the entire top of the pavement off. Then we come back with grooving blades. Now, here's a little difference. In this particular surface, we use a 95 thousandths wide blade to create this groove. You may recall that in both the safety grooving and in the conventional diamond grinding, we used 125 thousandths, an eighth inch blade. We use a thinner blade in this particular case to reduce any kind of vehicle tracking or wandering. And we also space those blades a little closer together. One half to five eighths of an inch, center to center. Again, you may recall with the safety grooving, it's three quarters of an inch, center to center. So a few little tweaks there, but in very, very broad strokes, we're combining diamond grinding, conventional diamond grinding with safety grooving. Now it's, it, it's gonna be a very, very flat surface. It's as smooth as a concrete pavement can be, but despite the flatter, smoother riding surface, it still has, uh, a, a great, a reliable micro texture, and uh, that's because of the aggregates. So the, the qualifier we always throw out there, if someone says, is this a candidate for the next generation surface, are you using high quality friction aggregates? Because we are peeling the paste off the top of the pavement. The friction numbers that you get the day we build it are the friction numbers that we would expect you to have five years and 10 years from now because we're relying on that micro texture for the dry weather friction. The longitudinal grooves are what provide the substantial macro texture and the increased resistance to hydroplaning, again, by providing escape route for the water to, to be ejected from between the tire pavement interface. So in terms of uh, macro texture, here we measured mean texture depth. And uh, as we go up the y-axis here, uh, the numbers increase, that's uh, increased macro texture. And you can see here, the next generation concrete surface has an abundance of macro texture as compared to grooved AstroTurf, exposed aggregate, conventional diamond grinding, uh, AstroTurf drag, so on and so forth. You can see NGCS just crushes it. It has tons of macro texture. Now you can use the next gen on either new construction or you can use it on existing surfaces. It's, uh, it can be constructed you know, quickly and efficiently without impacting other roadway features such as the guardrails, barriers, curbs, overhead signs and all that kind of stuff. Essentially what we're looking to do is take off an eighth, a quarter, in extreme situations, you know, maybe uh, three eighths of an inch on average across a pavement surface. So again, we're not really worried about slopes and, and anything else associated with the road in terms of having to be changed. So we just don't go off willy-nilly and, and develop something, put a name on it, and then try to go out and, and promote it. We enlisted a number of different uh, state DOT partners, as mentioned, KDOT, Kansas Department of Transportation, work with us on this, as well as uh, Minnesota DOT, where uh, we conduct the three years of field testing up there on the Min Road uh, Pavement Research Facility. And uh, we, we tried it with both high and low volume traffic. And we found that through testing that uh, the sound level was typically around the sub 100 decibel level and uh, added up to be the, the quietest non-porous concrete surface ever measured. 
and continue, continues to be so. So again, looking at the K.I-70 numbers uh, far and away, the, the next generation surface was uh, the quietest of all the concrete sections. And we managed to piggyback on a NCHRP project 10-67, where once again, uh, both the conventional diamond grinding and the next generation concrete surface both measured in around the 100 level and, and beat out all the other available surface textures that were being tested and that are readily available for you today when you're paving concrete. So we uh, also enlisted a couple of uh, universities, uh, Virginia Tech, a couple quotes from their reports, quote, a measurable and noticeable decrease of more than five decibels for the NGCS. NGCS is reliable in terms of noise variability between different locations, which means it's not a fluke and it's not uh, aggregate dependent or climate dependent. We can take it from you know, Houston to Duluth and uh, expect the same results. And then UC Davis reported that uh, NGCS was, quote, quieter than conventional diamond grinding and also offered improved smoothness as measured by the IRI. So again, it's a premium pavement. And then uh, in terms of a case study, uh, the, the one that I, I like to cite is uh, Interstate 10 in Houston. You may recall I-10 is a coast-to-coast -coast route, big-time uh, truck route. And um, it was expanded in the Houston area uh, several years ago, up to 26 lanes, and they, they claim it to be the widest roadway in the United States. Uh, it really became a noise-sensitive area. Uh, due in part to the fact that it was so clogged before it was expanded that the speed was more like 45 and 50. Uh, and once they add all these additional lanes, the, the speed ratcheted up to more like 75, and, and the, that created more noise in the neighborhoods. And you know, people literally couldn't go in their backyard and have a barbecue and have a, a normal discussion because it was so loud in the vicinity. So they definitely needed to do something, the, the uh, Texas Department of Transportation. They consider uh, putting noise reducing overlays on there, but if you just take a look at the traffic in the picture, uh, the one thing they were loath to do is ever try to put up traffic control after this job is done and, and try to slow things down. It you know, had miles long backups when they were doing the grinding project. They didn't want to do it again. Uh, there was over 750,000 square yards on this particular project, over 100 lane miles. And uh, the average noise was reduced by 75%, which is, that's a big number. The skid numbers increased by 60%. And this is over your standard longitudinally timed concrete pavement. Smoothness, 73% to, uh, to 305% improvement. It's just absolutely fantastic. And Texas is now the largest user of the next gen surface in the world. They have uh, millions of square yards all through the Houston area. But the use of the product is just not limited to uh, the United States, nor is it limited to just highway pavement. Uh, there's a number of different countries that have uh, experimented with and actually have adopted the uh, next generation surface. Uh, we see Germany, uh, and Austria, and South Korea for that matter, not only adopting it, but trying to tweak it, trying to make it a better product. And interestingly enough, uh, South Korea uses the next gen surface in a majority of their tunnels. Any tunnel that's over like a kilometer long uh, has the next gen surface applied. And uh, they take great pride in their, in their tunnels. And the, I was there just a few years ago. It's amazing how many tunnels they have. If you want to go from east coast to west coast or vice versa, you're going to spend 50% of the time in a tunnel. And uh, as you can see, they have them well lit, and uh, there's music playing in there, and it's actually not a bad environment for a tunnel, uh, especially for a guy coming from New York that uh, has been in the Holland Tunnel and so on, which is the opposite of nice, if you know what I mean. But a uh, really cool use of the product. Um, in general, though, what we have here using the diamond saw cut surface textures is a smoother ride, no matter what you're going for. If you're trying to reduce noise, uh, a conventional diamond grind is going to give you a smooth pavement along for the ride, and vice versa. It, uh, you're going to have a more uniform ride for sure. In terms of safety, all three of the textures are going to in increase your, your friction numbers and uh, reduce your potential for hydroplaning due to the increased macro texture. Certainly, uh, the uh, longitudinal grooving, the safety grooving is uh, an amazing product to apply in areas where you have run off the road accidents, and it's incredibly cheap. 
when you think about the benefits that you get. In terms of money-wise, and I didn't put it in the slide, and I don't know why I didn't, but um, let's say that you're paying $3 for a, uh, a conventional diamond grind, ground surface. Rule of thumb would say, okay, I'm going to pay about $1.50 for safety grooving, so half of the conventional diamond grinding. And uh, if you're going to use the next generation concrete surface, you would double that conventional number. So we'd be looking at maybe six bucks per square yard to apply that. So uh, when I say that the, probably the best money you could ever spend on a pavement in terms of safety would be uh, longitudinal grooving. That, that's hard to beat at uh, such a low cost and such a good track record. And the, uh, the challenge is for real. If you have a bad spot and you want to try something, uh, please contact me or just pull me aside after the program here today and we'll see if we can't put something together over the course of the summer and bring your worst and let's see what happens. It'll be fun. So uh, I believe, well, this is my last slide here, yeah. In summary, the motorists that we're dealing with these days are demanding safe, smooth, quiet, and delay-free roadways, and we all know there's just not enough money to get the job done. Diamond saw cut textures are a time-proven, cost-effective means of providing consistently smooth, quiet, and safe textures at a very competitive cost. The next gen is going to be the smoothest concrete surface that you can have. It's ultra-smooth, high friction, and it has acoustically durable properties, and it should last the, the life of your pavement. So far, that NGCS has been used in 14 states, uh, four countries uh, on a regular basis, and is the low-noise concrete surface texture. And if you're looking to learn more uh, about what we talked about today, IGGA.net is the website. It's loaded with uh, information for you. Or, as mentioned, just pull me aside, and I'd love to have a chat with you. Thanks for your attention. I appreciate it. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.